Ravi Sharma, welcome to Property Insights. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Now, you're a buyer's agent. You're also a YouTuber. And your YouTube is called uh, At Personal Finance with Ravi Sharma. Um, I get, and you're a young bloke. Um, maybe you can sort of tell me why a young guy like you is involved in personal finance and, and, and what sort of personal finance are you talking about? You're talking about in terms of finance in relation to building asset classes, which include property or wh where are you at? Yeah, so um, probably some context. Yeah. Um, I've obviously been into real estate for a while, but what I realized very early on uh, was finance is quite dry. And especially for us, you know, young guys, uh, including yourself, Mark, um, yeah. you know, we find that we get turned away from learning about basic concepts of finance because it wasn't entertaining or... What do you mean by, Ravi, what do you mean by finance? Are you saying like how I use my credit card or, you know, like getting a mobile phone or... Yeah, I think even before up? that, it's more like basic level. You know, are we saving to save? Are we saving to invest? Um, why are we investing? What are we investing in? And such a rabbit hole that you can go down. And I feel like just growing up with my friends as well, they just wouldn't really want to understand those things because maybe we had a really dodgy teacher that was, you know, not teaching us the right things or, you know, a dodgy family member was doing the wrong thing and sort of turns us off it. And so that's why I created the YouTube channel. Right. So, so did you like have any personal experience with, with dodginess? Because <laughs> we use the word dodgy a few times. Ever. Do you have any personal experience in relation to this? No, not personally. Yeah. Um, but did you, know, you see it? Yeah, I saw it. I saw it and I saw, you know, whether it was a family member going and trusting a financial advisor um, who was actually getting kickbacks from people two years later we're you know left with nothing um also saw my dad you know get screwed over with his super when it was the gfc time so he wanted to take more accountability with those things um and so when i started realizing that information was out there it just wasn't presented in the same way or the right way um taking a lot of lessons from like the us market the uk market influencers have a bad name now but um you know just trying to do the right thing by getting basic concepts out Right. So at, at what age are we talking about now? Like you, we were at school or? Yeah, well, I started the YouTube channel only like three and a half years ago. And on how old job? How, how, how old were you then? Uh, 27. 27. So right. yeah, I'm 31 now. Yes, right. 27. So you saw, but did you, did you see this when you were at school? I mean, because what I'm trying to get to is, um, are you, and is your audience, um, are they of school age? No, I would say that now over time that it's grown to the where it's grown to, I probably find that the demographic is like, you know, sort of 22 to 32, right? So it's, it's not like I'm coming out of school. Yeah. Um, however, I've started receiving a lot more emails from guys that are 16 to 18 saying, hey, look, I, I really like the concept of investing. I have no money though. I still have to complete schooling. So I do, st I'm starting to see the audience diversify um, into a younger audience. But I think that's primarily because, you know, if I start posting content on TikTok, naturally a demographic that's uh, younger there as well. So uh, just give me a little insight into the demographic of people who are interested in personal finance. Are we talking about male, female? What are we looking at? Yeah, so my channel largely is like 90% males um, and the channel is around Australian real estate and personal finance. So naturally, 90% of the audience is Australian too. And we're looking at ethnicity. We saw, like we talked about your, you know, your um, uh, Bryans and Smiths and Johnsons. Or are we talking about... Uh, you know, the opolises and the, uh, the itises and everything else. What, what are we looking at? Uh, look, it's it's been a mix. Yeah. So, you know, if I look at the last 10 people that signed up to the buyer's agency or subscribed to the channel, it's all a mix. Right. right. So it's, it's, it's a general mix of, of everybody. Yeah, correct. Because what I'm trying to get my head around is, um, is it because some schools, um, whether they're state or private, and in, and in particular per state, are, are some places providing a better, um, fund, are providing better fundamentals to young people when they come out of school? I mean, is this, a, is this an education problem, a school problem? Um, a bit of both, I think. Um, but I think it's more so rather than the school changing their syllabus and, you know, teaching the wrong things or the right things at different schools, I think it's more the people going to those schools, the conversations that are happening between parents. Um, you know, if they've traditionally been good with finance, they're having good money talks with their kids and then that translates into friends and family as well. That's interesting. Um, I, I just think that, uh, you know, just a little bit of my experience on this and obviously I'm out of touch with the young kids today but I just know that probably for the last 30 odd years of my 40 year period or 50 year period in business that schools have never really provided any proper education in terms of finance some 
maybe more privileged schools do, but generally speaking, on average, schools don't. They don't tell it. They don't teach anyone anything about entrepreneur entrepreneurialism either, or you know how you use a credit card, how you use a mobile phone account, um, let alone saving money to, and uh, how you invest and what you should invest in, when you should uh, start to think about investing. Um, and it's sort of up to the kids, and the, when they become young adults, to start to look for this stuff and they look you know they're going to find you on youtube for example but they've got to have a reason to look for it in the first place so what do you think that's about i mean how do we get them to be interested as opposed to start learning but how do we get them to be interested in the topic as opposed to just thinking about cars and instagram and every other thing to think about today yeah i think it's um it's a double-edged sword right like with instagram instant gratification people looking at what you're doing i'm going to go see how i can do it uh, but i think we can also use it to our advantage. And I think the right messaging needs to come across. Like if you look at, you know, socials five, 10 years ago, it was all like, hey, look, I was successful. Look at my car, look at how I'm dressed. And they were probably dressed in like a really fancy three-piece suit. And then people would aspire to go, okay, I need to do what that person's doing. I think that narrative has changed. You know, like we're sitting here, black t-shirts on, right? Which I love because that's my whole brand is how do we do this so it's accessible by normal people? You know, um, everyday people, we don't need to put up a front it is what it is. And I think when people sort of break down those, you know, barriers around what is cool, what's not cool, can I be myself? Do I need to be fake to sell something? Um, I, I think that's going to get us heading into the right direction. What is it that, I mean, and this includes superannuation too, what is it that doesn't turn young people on about <laughs> investing like uh you know they they see the super they don't even consider it's theirs they couldn't give a shit about the super mm -hmm. um, they're happy to take it but they don't care about it um they're not thinking and, and equally they're probably living day by day they're not thinking about what's going to happen when i turn 65 or whatever retirement age will be in that but by the time they retire was it what is it in their heads um do they give up are they give saying, oh, this is all too bloody hard i'm never going to get a house like mum and dad have got is it about that or? i reckon it's exactly that it's going why would i listen to someone who did this 50 years ago your circumstances were different and then the person who did it 50 years ago is like yeah but interest rates were higher back then you say yeah but like you know i could have bought a house for like fifty thousand dollars so there's that disconnect with going young people don't want to listen to the old guys because they're like you don't understand my circumstances now. You don't live on social media. You didn't get brought up in this environment. And I think because of that, they're like, some old dude's talking about super. Well, I'm not going to listen to you. I don't care about my super. I need to do what I need to do. Um, so I think that disconnect has made it difficult for young people to sort of go and trust someone or go, I'm going to follow this advice because this person's done it in a time where I'm doing it now. Do you think young people have given up? on, on buying an investment property or, or an owner-occupied pro property? Yeah, I think we're getting very close. I think people have now gone, a majority of people, uh, especially when I'm speaking to them, it's, you know, you're making 200, 300K as a couple and you're telling me you still can't buy a house in Sydney. That's the environment we're in. I know interest rates have gone up, you know, um, quite considerably lately, but that affordability piece has always been a concern. But I think we're getting to the point where people are now have alternatives where you go, I can live anywhere, work from anywhere. It's easy for me to, you know, get information about a new country. I can shift there. Um, whereas that wasn't really a reality, say, 20 years ago. So people are going, why would I now have to buy an apartment in Sydney, live day by day and, you know, trek it to work for an hour when I can move overseas? Or I can live in Bali, work from there and, you know, be a contractor. Well, but that would apply to that. That's a reasonably, oh, I don't know the answer to this, but I, maybe I'll ask you the question. Is that a reasonably small percentage of the population of those young people? Because like if I'm a plumber or electrician or a tradie, I have to work here. Yep. And I have to sort of pretty much live around where I'm working. Um, now that doesn't mean you necessarily got to uh, work in Sydney. You can work in Ballon or, you know, regional areas, Orange, which is screaming out for uh, tradies. So is Ballon. Um, you know, Gold Coast is screaming out for tradies. Um, so you could live close to that. Um, it, it so those people who you're talking about who can live in Bali, for example, and work, they might be people who operate on, um, you know, software. They pretty much spend their day doing administrative sort of tasks, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you don't need to be customer facing or you don't need to be on the tools. Do you have a sense of what percentage of the population that is in, in that cohort of people? I mean, is, are we talking about a small percentage of the population or a, or a, a bigger percentage of the population relative to, you know, who has to go onto the tools? I think um, it depends on that age group. Um, and 
you know, I don't have the data to be able to back it up to go, there's 90% of people that are in that space. But I think the younger people are going, you know, you guys experienced the pandemic, the lockdowns, you guys got filthy rich because money got printed. There was so much more money in the system. Now money gets drained. The people who own assets are getting even richer or, you know, wealthier. I get left behind because I was at school. I didn't, I wasn't making enough money. Now that I am making money, I can't buy anything. So I think they're going to start basing their decisions around careers and opportunities in the future around, well, if that means I'm doing something that might not pay me as much, but now I can live somewhere that's going to be like 20% of my costs. Well, why would I want to make 200K and then let 50% go to taxes, then have to, you know, fund a unit that I don't even love? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So they've been quite practical about it, but it also tells me they've given up. But mind you, mind you it doesn't mean you're going to live in Sydney. Just because yeah, you're brought up and born and bred in Sydney and your parents brought you up in Sydney and they've got a house in Sydney, it doesn't mean you live in Sydney. You might, you might want to live in, um, in Fiji. You might want to live in um, Bali, as you say. You might want to live in far north Queensland as long as you can get some work in those environments and the way transport works so that you can get back and forth to Sydney to see your family anyway. Mm -hmm. And everything is... Uh, and today you can do everything on FaceTime or whatever, not even FaceTime, just all the other... Uh, uh, protocols that allow you to talk to someone direct and actually look at them and probably over time we'll be getting um you know even more sophisticated in that regard we might even be able to actually transport the individual and i don't mean in a physical sense but transport their image so i can actually talk to them yep off a screen in front of me um and so i guess we've got a changing mode or technologies allowed us to be working much more remote from say main cities what do you say to those people though who say, okay, I am a tradie. I've decided most of the work here is here in Sydney. Um, I can't afford to live in, buy in Sydney, um, but I, my work is here and I don't want, really don't want to move anywhere else. What do you say to them as a buyer's agent about what they should be doing in terms of investing in the property market? Because they've also decided I want to, somehow I want to invest in the property market. What, where are you suggesting them to go? How do they go about it? The only other solution they have, in my opinion, is rent vesting. So that's something I do is I've always, um, you know, since I moved out of home, it's always been I'm going to invest elsewhere and I'll rent here. Right. So um, rent vesting is a term. Yep. Um, a lot of people don't know what it means. What's it mean? So essentially renting where you want to live and then buying and investing in areas that logically make sense. Or you can afford. Or where you can afford. So if you look at it comparatively going, I can afford $500,000. That 500,000 in Sydney gets me a one bedroom apartment. In Perth, might give me a house. Or in Wollongong, it might get me a, uh, an apartment, a new apartment with a view. Correct. Or in ACT, Canberra rather, yep. it might get me a brand new apartment mm -hmm. in the middle of town. Yep. Close to, close to where all the people work. Now, and, and I guess what you're talking about then is when you're buying those things, you're a, um, not an owner occupier, but you're a, an investor. Um, so what's the path? What, so you talk to them, you make that suggestion, rent vesting. Um, is it rent vesting or rent investing? Rent vesting. Rent vesting. Yep. So you suggest them rent vesting and they go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. So what's the next thing you say to them? What, what do you, how do you set them up? I think then you've got to look at, you know, the, the end goal. So for a lot of people, uh, especially like for myself as well, it's I would love to own my own home one day, right? And the dream home, wherever it needs to be, maybe what is it that? is in Sydney. What's what? the dream home for yeah, me? Tell me. <laughs> um, it's uh it, i'm gonna pretend like i've never thought about this but i've always thought about it Tell me, um, yeah, I'm dying to know. and it's um you know it's it's near water in sydney um i was born here i love it every time i travel i come back going i feel so re-energized being back in sydney this is home and i think fortunately or unfortunately i love my family so much that i just can't move elsewhere my partner's the same so she's in the boat where we can travel for as long as we want, but we're always going to want to come back and hang out with family. So it's going to be in Sydney. And the reality is it's probably going to be a purchase of four or five million dollars. And then if we want a house the way we want it, we're probably going to have to build something which costs another two mil. Right. right. So the reality is it's a seven to eight mil sort of project. Um, so for me, if I want to do this right, I can't go out there, blow out all my borrowing capacity by buying a house for two million dollars, settle uh, in you know a different part of Sydney and say call it a day I think at 31 I've got choice and for a lot of people that are coming to us uh, whether it's the buyer's agency or just approaching me through emails the reality is they all pretty much want the same goal which is financial freedom have a house paid off and self-retirement but what we got taught is you got to buy your house first and then hope that you pay it off over 30 years and then retire on your super 
but there's so many different ways we can do it, especially with different asset classes too. I mean, I know we talk about real estate a lot, but there's emerging markets as well, emerging assets that people don't want to pay attention to. And now as well, it's not frowned upon as much as it was 10 years ago, where if you decided to start up your own business or a side hustle for $10,000 a year, that could increase your borrowing capacity by, by a lot versus you trying to work an extra five, six hours a week to get a, a pay rise of say $2,000. So there's numerous ways to get there. And I think the approach that we've taken is let's start with the end goal. Okay, cool. We know what the end goal looks like. Now come back to the present and say, can we realistically do that by wanting to splurge out on a million dollar house now? And that's it, you're stuck. Or can we go out there, buy a couple of different properties, different markets, and then be in the mentality that I'm not emotionally attached to any of this. So if I need to trade out one of these properties, if it's the right time of the cycle, I will do that. Whereas before the saying was, you know, you buy and never sell. Mm. So you're, so I think you're suggesting then one uh, strategy would be to buy a number of properties, less expensive properties, and just keep adding to that. Perhaps trade in and out sometimes, but just keep adding to that. Adding to that, then over time, have enough of these properties. They're all going to have debt on them, but have enough of these properties, which have gone up in value, such that you could probably sell everything, mm -hmm. and then go buy your dream house. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, you you might be in a position where you find yourself in 10, 15 years where you could probably sell half the properties, have enough for a deposit to buy the dream home, have some debt on it, but now the properties that you purchased early on incomes there positive cash flow allows you to make the repayments on your mortgage now you get best of both worlds and i think most people are going out there trying to buy the lamborghini first i'm trying to buy buy a fleet of ubers and taxis that will eventually get me there faster with more choice yeah so the old the old way was you bought your owner occupied house that you're gonna live in for the rest of your life now at 23 24 25 when you got married then you went and bought your investment portfolio you added to your portfolio with in, in, like small investments around the place to live off the rent and the capital gains. Um, what you're suggesting is maybe we've got to flip that and uh, do that in reverse, um, buy smaller chunks. So you're sort of like basically chunking it out and you're chunking, chunking it out over time and then renting wherever you want to live. And uh, because generally speaking, and there's some mathematics in this, generally speaking, the house where you want to live, generally speaking, in terms of the rent you would pay, is quite a small yield relative to the value of the house. Because houses in Sydney, for example, um, an expensive house in Sydney doesn't have a rental that anywhere would in any way, shape, or form reflect the interest payments on that same property if you bought it and borrowed mm. the money. It just doesn't happen that way. At the expensive end, at the cheaper end, it's a bit different. But so. You find a less expensive market because over time that makes more sense because you can sort of do it in increments. And it also takes the frustration away too because you're never going to be able to buy the really expensive house anyway. And all yeah. you're going to do is get down on yourself and you don't do anything. And if you don't do anything, you're not going to you're going to feel fairly much dejected. And then all of a sudden you're going to start spending all the dough you have, all the excess money you have. So is it? What about saving for a deposit? So. I mean, Let's say I'm going to buy a five hundred thousand dollars house. Um, let's say I need a fifty thousand dollars deposit. I'm going to pay stamp duty as well. Five hundred thousand dwelling should probably won't be a house, mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to pay the stamp duty on that, which is going to be like um, you know fifteen twenty thousand. Um, how how do people save this money? What, do you, what, what techniques are there? I think there's no magic pill um, and people are looking for a magic pill at the moment. So they're looking for the home run. They're saying, how do I go into things like crypto and go and do a 10x or 20x in a year or 12 months? And, and I think that's the wrong way to approach it because reality is the people that are looking for the quick flip are also going to lose it on the other way, right? So even if they made a 10x somehow, they're probably going to lose it within two years. You can so, lose 10x, you can lose 12x. So yeah, say, no. yeah, exactly. So it's more about the principles behind what am I doing with the $10 that I have left, am I splurging $10 out? And I know, you know, the purchasing power is a lot less now than it was 20 years ago. But the reality is the principles stay the same. So if you're in the mindset that go, okay, I can only save $20,000 this year. What's the point? Because I'm always falling behind. There's always choice. There's always $20,000 could go into giving you security to actually leave your job because you have a passion that leads to a side hustle, gets you into a business. You're making twice as much in five years time. So I think the approach is, Forget about what everyone else is doing because everyone's got a different starting point. And then coming back down to the basics of what do you enjoy? What do you like? And can you monetize it in the next five, 10 years? 
because what you achieve in such a small amount of time you you're totally aware of this where what you estimate you can achieve in a short amount of time is you know you greatly overestimate whereas in a longer period of time you greatly underestimate what you can achieve and i think if we get out of the window of thinking how do i retire in two years to going hey if i can retire at 45 or 50 i'm still retiring 15 to 20 years earlier than what i thought initially i was going to on my own terms so i think it's just that time perspective and then from there you'll go okay $75,000 might get me a unit here in Sydney, but it could get me all of these other things elsewhere. So is, is retirement a thing in the minds of, say, somewhere between 20 and 30? I mean, they're actually thinking about that. To be honest, so I was just saying to one of your um, team members that I just came back from Thailand and it was me sitting on a beach, relaxing, reading a book. And the first two days felt amazing. The third and fourth day, I was like, I need to be building something. I need to do something. And I think the reality is 20s and 30s, you're like, I'm in the hustle mode. I'm doing jobs I don't like. So you're going, how do I get out of this? How do I get out? Until you find something you love. And, you know, it's the exact same reason you're here, mate, because you like doing what you do. And so when you find something you actually love doing, it doesn't really feel like work anymore. So that is what retirement is now. It's not, hey, I've got all the money in the world. I'll just sit there. You deteriorate. Your mind deteriorates. You've got nothing going on. So I think when you're in your 20s and 30s, the only reason you're thinking about it is because you're probably doing shit you don't like. But when you find something you love, you're like, how do I do this for the next 10, 15 years? And if it's not this, how do I pivot, have other investments, have other passion businesses and grow up that way? Should we be um, thinking differently about retirement? Should we, I mean, should all of us, your age group, every, every age group, thinking, why do I need to retire 65? In fact, it's just a... It's just a fake date. Um, why don't I need to retire at all? Um, what does retirement mean to me? Um, maybe working less perhaps, but does retirement mean working four days a week or three days a week? Or is retirement for me, maybe we should be defining retirement early and then revising it every year. Because some people retirement mean, I got mates who are in this category, retirement for them means not going to work. Um, and pa playing golf every day. Mm -hmm. I could think of nothing worse. Um, but but, but, but you know, some guys are like that. That's their deal. Yep. Others, uh, women I know, their retirement is hanging out with the grandkids. That's, mm -hmm. you know, again, for me, like I've got grandkids, but like it's not my, it's not my <laughs> thing. You know, I'm going to like seeing them, but I don't want to hang out with them all the time. I mean, I like to create things, do things, uh, make a difference, change things, blah, blah. Um, do you think maybe we should start to um, redefine how we live our lives? Because... Retirement is sort of like a very structured way of living your life. You, you leave school, maybe you go to university, maybe you don't. You get a job, either way, you potentially uh, go into partnership with somebody. Together you might buy a property. You might do it in reverse form, like you just suggest. You might buy a number of properties and buy your dream home. But all of it's sort of heading towards the day I stop work mm -hmm. and I don't have a mortgage and I've got my house and I'm secure for the rest of my life and blah, 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 and I don't have to go to work anymore. Um, I reckon we need to start to redefine how we are going to live our lives. I 100% agree, but it's like moving the goalposts. You're like, you've got all these people for the last 20, 30 years thinking retirement, 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 and then suddenly we change the rules to go, retirement might be just you doing shit you like and you know balanced holidays and things like that. And they're going, that's not what I signed up for 20 years ago. And so I think it's going to take time, um, but you're 100% right. I th and I think it's happening with the younger ones where they're realizing there were options and suddenly they can go, well, I don't actually want to do that when I'm older. I want to do that now. So they might be comfortable working for a lot longer, but if they do something they love, they can do it for you know years and years. And and, and, and actual fact too, you know, if you're 65 under the old system and you're retiring 65 and you don't have a debt, um, because you're going to stop working. The reason you don't have any debt is because you actually stopped working. You can't pay the debt off anymore. So you need to have no debt at mm -hmm. 65. But but on the, on the flip side of it, if you take the view, no, I'm, I'm going to be able to work um, and I want to work, then you don't need to have your debt paid off at 65, which means you don't actually have to enter the market at 25. You can go buy the property at 40. And, and, and there's another part to all this too. It's one thing to say, the reason why we used to try and retire at 65, if I go back 40 years, is because we died at 75. <laughs> That's the bottom Fair line. Fair enough, yeah. We had 10 years of, of to enjoy. not working. Mm -hmm. Today, and by the time you're 65, the, the, you know, the lifespan of a, a male in Australia would probably be 91 instead of 81. In which case, if you're retiring 65 and you're going to live for another 20 20 years, uh, 30 years, 25 years, 
you need to continue work because you no way in the world you're gonna have enough money saved up mm-hmm. to retire on so we I, I actually think there needs to be a conversation about this like a national conversation about what does retirement mean why do we even have to use that word it's a shitty word it means what my grandparents did my parents did um and or are doing it that's what it means today when it's i think it's actually totally irrelevant um i think we should be saying what are we going to do in in the 50 to 60 what are we going to do in 60 to 70 what are we doing between 70 and 80 um how long are we going to live let's make a different assumption let's assume we're going to live to 90 um and the way medicine's going we're going to live better mm-hmm. so you know if we get colon cancer we'd be able to get a cure if we get a skin cancer we'd be able to cure it if we get a you know, uh, prostate cancer, we got a cure. If we get breast cancer, we're going to be able to cure it. You know, most things, if we've got a heart problem, we're going to get a new heart. <laughs> if we get a kidney problem, we get new kidneys. You know, I'm saying, like, that's yeah, yeah, where 100%. it's going to be. By the time, you, time you're in your 60s, there's going to be cures for just about everything. Mm-hmm. There might be a few things not cured, but you're going to have access to these things. And you want to be in a position to afford to be able to access them. Correct. And you, but you've got, and which means you probably need to still work. Mm-hmm. So we need a complete redefinition of retirement. And what I and what is the rush? Why am I rushing between twenty and thirty to get on this uh, merry-go-round, mm-hmm. which actually is goes for much longer than it always traditionally did? I understand I had to get on the merry-go-round at twenty-five. We're not going to give up at, th- at sixty-five, but now it's I have maybe have to get off at eighty, but I'm talking in relative terms. So shit, maybe I don't have to get onto the merry-go-round until I'm forty. So take a bit of pressure off yourself. 100 percent, and i think it even extends beyond that where we're talking about 65 where 65 year olds currently are going to be very different to how we will be at 65 because again modern medicine you're doing things you've got more education you probably got more time exercising things like that so you know what's important so suddenly 65 is how most people are at 50 right and that level of energy so you suddenly go well i don't actually want to sit there and do nothing and so if I am living till 90... Well, you will die at 75 yeah. if you do that. that. That's what happens. Yeah, correct, yeah. You clock out. And so if you have that mentality that, oh, I'm going to get to 65, you finally get there and we haven't planned for it. Unfortunately, we all get driven by emotion. And that's where the media jumps in and we have a field day when it comes to such extreme narratives. We have something crashing one day, have something booming the next day, and it really manipulates how we feel. And I think that 20 to 30 year olds are not only just seeing it on normal TV, if they don't see it there, they're seeing it on social media and they're consuming so much of it. So I think going back to your point, I 100% agree. Take that time. And that's what I advocated on the channel for so long, which is in your 20s, go and try 10 different careers. Go and try all those different jobs. Whereas I had friends that now got to a point eight years into their career. They're like, if I sidestep into a different career, I take a 50% pay cut. I'm like, yeah, but if you love that, in five years time, you'll make twice as much anyway. And unfortunately, we get driven by these narratives, the social norms of like, oh, I've got to do this, you know, do it quickly. And there's also, and you're right, it's because it's I know people like that and they get a bit panicky. And also people having kids later too. So, you know, when I got married, first, I mean, everyone was having kids in their 20s. You had mm. kids in your 20s, you got married in your 20s, you bought a house in your 20s and that was it. And you got a job. Um, now, not many people get um, married in their 20s. Uh, not many people having kids in their 20s, some, but not many. Um, and we're living much, much longer. So it's very interesting. Um, I think what I'm getting from this today, particularly in relation to your age cohort, we just need to revisit the whole discussion. And I actually think it's a government thing. Government should be doing this sort of stuff. Um, but they're not. They won't. Because unfortunately, most of the government are 65. And they're not thinking this way. They're thinking old school. That's why uh, you know, um, a YouTube series like yours, you know, you as a YouTuber, someone represents an age group um, and, and, and it's probably even better a style of thinking, um, a realm of thinking, like a, there's a segment of thinking. I don't even know if we should limit it to age, age groups. We should say there are people in a certain cohort, an audience, who think a certain way. They tend to be younger, but mm-hmm. they think a certain way and they access different uh, news feeds, um, they access different modes of information. And when I say they think a different way, they think maybe longer and less, they, they think with less pressure. Mm-hmm. They are not lazy. They are not um, thoughtless. They're not uneducated. They're just, they're, in fact, the opposite. They're quite thoughtful, quite well educated, and well structured in their thinking, and know that there's no rush. They're thinking smarter. Yeah. And I think that often when someone goes, oh, I can do this an easier way or a smarter way, people often see that as being lazy. 
but they're just looking for alternatives. And if they that means they get the best of both worlds, especially being younger, well, why not? Well, Ravi Sharma from At Personal Finance with Ravi Sharma and Ravi Sharma, the buyer's agent. Um, mate, thanks very much for opening up a whole new way of thinking in relation to a co- cohort of people that exist in this country that ordinarily are not spoken to. I appreciate it, Mark. Thank you.